the gilesa, the defilements, and dukkha disturb us and bother us so as to, so that we are, so that we cannot be cool or joyful. The problem is <clears throat> that dukkha arises from the fact that we don't know ourselves. This thing we can call, we call dukkha has many symptoms, conditions, characteristics, but we can, we can summarize it as saying dukkha is what makes the mind agitated. It's what we must endure and bear and suffer through. And it takes away the mind's freedom in being cool and calm. It destroys the mind's freedom, ability to be free in coolness and calmness. The knowledge that is Dhamma could be called psychology if we want, because psychology has many different branches to it. However, if we're going to call Dhamma psychology, we have to understand that it is the study of the mind which has to do with joy and calmness, not, not the kind of psychology that has to do with material benefits, material advantages. When we know Dhamma and then practice Dhamma and then receive the benefits of that practice of Dhamma, this is something these we can know for ourselves. We don't have to have any teacher tell us or point out what has happened. We know it ourselves through the lessening of dukkha. We can see that for ourselves as dukkha lessens through the practice and the receiving <coughs> of the benefits of Dhamma. Those people who point out the attainments of, of meditators or give out certificates for various levels of attainment, these are absolutely meaningless. The only thing that has any meaning is when we know for ourselves that dukkha has lessened. This practice we can call jita bhavana or mental development. This is a progress, this is for the mind to develop and progress. For this development there are two aspects, samatha, tranquility, and vipassana, insight. We need both of these, we need both samatha and vipassana. The first one Tranquility or samatha is when the mind is calm and ready to know, ready to see. It's prepared to see. And then vipassana or insight is when that highly trained calm mind sees. These go together, samatha and vipassana. Samatha or samadhi alone that is, tranquility or concentration alone isn't enough. For this reason, we need to practice anapanasati completely, not just the beginning stages, but we need to follow it through to the end in order to accomplish both samatha and vipassana, in order to know and to see. When we're born, we have just about no knowledge at all. And so young children or infants speak, think wrongly, speak wrongly, and act wrongly. They go around speaking wrongly, thinking wrongly, and acting wrongly because instinctual knowledge isn't enough. And so as they grow, they just continue 
thinking wrongly, speaking wrongly, and acting wrongly. Then as the, the young infant grows and goes through life thinking wrongly, speaking wrongly, and acting wrongly, dukkha arises out of all these wrong things, and this dukkha grows and builds. As this dukkha is experienced and grows and builds, we begin to see it and reach a point where we realize we just can't take it anymore, that we can't endure all this dukkha it's too much. And then at this point we become interested in finding a way out of dukkha and we look for the Dhamma, the way out, in order to be free of all this dukkha. This is, this is the facts of the way things work. So at this point, we begin to hate dukkha, we're afraid of it, we're disgusted with it, and we develop a strong desire to get rid of, to extinguish or put out dukkha. And so then we begin to be interested in the kind of knowledge that is necessary for extinguishing dukkha. And that knowledge are, is the Four Noble Truths, the Arya Satya. And for this reason, we will now examine the Arya Satya very closely. The Arya Satya are four, four things, the four noble truths. The first one is the noble truth of Dukkha. The second is the noble truth of the cause of Dukkha. The third is the Arya Satya of the extinction of Dukkha, and the fourth is the Arya Satya of the path that leads to the extinction of Dukkha. We'll begin with Dukkha, the first Arya Satya, and we'll look at its meaning or definition sufficiently for you to understand what it is about. In the general meaning of this word as it's usually used. Dukkha means difficult to endure, hard to bear, hard to stand up to. This is speaking of the feeling or the vetana that we feel towards things that are undesirable, unpleasant, unwanted. This meaning isn't very difficult to understand. But what we need to do is look at some of the ways where people get things backwards, where they don't see dukkha in things that are dukkha, or they go so far as to think certain things are fun and enjoyable because they don't see the dukkha in these things. So we need to look at this area of dukkha. The first meaning of dukkha is difficult to endure, difficult to bear. The second meaning is that when we look and see it and know it, then, we, then it's ugly, it's hateful. In the second meaning, dukkha means if we know it well, then we'll hate it. The second meaning includes inanimate things also, like the sand, the rocks, the benches. When we look at these things, we see that they're constantly changing, that they're absolutely impermanent. And for this reason, they're hateful. So even inanimate things have this symptom of, of dukkha, of being unbearable. The first meaning is very easy to, to see. We can know it through our feelings. It's a feeling, so it's quite apparent. But the second meaning is, is very difficult to realize, and therefore we must use wisdom or insight to, to know it, to know this second meaning of dukkha. 
The third meaning of dukkha, <coughs> if we examine the word it, by its, its roots, or examine it etymologically, du means hateful, and ka means empty. So this means that when we look at look at it and see it, when we look at something that is du, when we look at dukkha and see it, we realize that that things are are empty of any essence or substance that is a self, a soul, an I, me, anything that we can attach to as a self. And then when we see that emptiness, that emptiness is hateful, it's ugly. And so the third meaning of dukkha is hatefully empty or disgustingly empty, disgustingly void. If we learn and study these three meanings, i.e., one, unendurable, two, when we've seen it, it's ugly, and three, completely void and empty. When we study these three, the more we study these three meanings, the more easy it is for us to see and realize what dukkha is. So I recommend that you, stud, you learn and study these meanings and able to help you to understand dukkha. The first meaning of difficult to endure, we should all know already, we should be quite familiar with that feeling. So then we need to examine the second meaning. This one is much more difficult for us to understand, this meaning of once it's seen, it's ugly, because we most of us haven't seen it. And all the things that satisfy us, that we like, that we love, we haven't really seen them as they are. And so we don't see this hateful, hatefulness in them because we haven't really looked. And so we need to really look. And if we keep looking more deeply, then we also see the third meaning, that these, that things are completely empty of any substance or essence. And because of that emptiness, they are dukkha. So we need to see all three of these meanings by looking more deeply into things. So we'll take these in order, in order to examine them. We'll begin with the most coarse kinds of dukkha. We can begin with sorrow, sadness, grief, lamentation, despair, physical pain, mental anguish. These are the coarser levels of dukkha, the ones which we have very little difficulty seeing. Next, it is dukkha when we are separated from something we love or when we meet up with something which we don't like or when we don't get things the way that, the way we want them, or when we don't get the things that we want. These are three further characteristics of dukkha. These are symptoms and characteristics of dukkha which common people are able to see and experience. Ordinary people feel these, and so they are able to know them. Because they are so easily seen, or realized, we call these the coarser levels of dukkha. The more, some more subtle levels of dukkha are as follows. Birth, aging, illness, and death. If we look at these, won't we see some dukkha in them? So these are some of the more subtle forms of dukkha. Many of our problems and many of the our, of our much of our experience of dukkha, if we examine it, we will see how that it, they are connected to 
birth, aging, illness, and death. So all sorts of kinds of dukkha are associated with birth, aging, illness, and death. It's not these four things themselves which are dukkha, but it's the problems that arise, the things that arise out of birth, aging, illness, and death, which are dukkha. If you look closely, if you examine these carefully, you'll see the way things are. The word birth can be seen in two ways. The first way is birth from our mother's womb. This kind of birth doesn't have that many problems associated with it. The second kind of birth is a mental kind of birth, birth that happens in the mind. This is the birth of my body or I, me, myself. This is the mental birth of the self. This kind of birth has associated with it all sorts of problems, an incredible number of problems. And also this kind of birth doesn't happen only once, like the physical birth from our mother's wombs. But this mental birth of the I, of the self, happens countless times in a lifetime, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands of times in one lifetime. And with all those births, there is a lot of dukkha. The second kind of birth we need to understand very well. This kind of birth arises from upadana, upadana, or attachment, clinging to things as I or mine. This upadana, or attachment, arises from ignorance, from avicca. And then from this birth arise all the other kinds of, all the kinds of dukkha. And so this is why we need to see this birth that arises from attachment and is caused by ignorance. Next is aging. And we have to look at aging on two levels, just as we did with birth. The first kind of aging, aging in the everyday conventional sense of the word, is the aging of the body. It's the growing old of the conditioning, the physical conditioning process that we call the body. This aging is very easy to see, and we're all quite familiar with it. Now we also need to see the second kind of aging. This kind of aging is present not only in old bodies, but this kind of aging is present in youth also. The second level of aging is buried or hidden within youth. So we need to see it within youth. To understand aging, we need to see both aspects of it, the aging of the body and the kind of aging which is hidden within, which is buried within youth. Within your own youth, each of you here, look within your own youth and see that there is aging, that there is old age already buried deep within that youth. See it, find that buried, hidden age and old age which is, bar which is hidden within your youth. Old age is just part of the evolutionary process that starts at the beginning and evolves toward extinction. And so from birth, there is old age. Old age and aging are present from birth. So take a good close look and see this old age hidden within your youth. Next, we come to illness and injury. Once again, there are two levels. There is the illness of the body, injury, and physical pain, which once again, we're all quite familiar with. But there is also illness of the mind, or illness and injury of the spirit. Whenever we think incorrectly, then this spiritual illness, this spiritual injury arises. We have to see both kinds 
of illness, both physical of the body and mental, illness of the spirit. When the body is sick or injured, we take it to the hospital to see a doctor, and that doctor can cure it. But when the mind or the spirit is injured and ill, we must take it to the Buddha. The Buddha is a doctor of the spirit, of spiritual disease and spiritual illness. So we have to know which doctor we need for our problems. If it's just a physical problem, we can find help in the hospital down the street. But if it's spiritual illness and disease, we need to seek aid from the Buddha or those followers who have preserved and carried on the Buddha's teaching. They have the knowledge we need to cure spiritual or physical, um, I'm sorry, spiritual illness. Now death. The first kind of death is death of the body. And we all know about that. The image of death strikes fear in all of us. We're all afraid of death. This we, we know quite well. There's, there's more to death than physical death. There's also spiritual death. For those of you who are Christians, you'll be familiar with the, the story on the first page of the book of Genesis. On the first page of the Bible, it talks about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that God told Adam not to eat the fruit from that tree, because if Adam was to go and eat that fruit, then he would die. This kind of death that God was talking about is spiritual death. So when Adam went and ate that fruit, when he ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then he knew good and evil. And from knowing good and evil, then he went and attached to it. He clung to these things, to good and evil. And so his mind began to work dualistically. And through this dualistic thinking, there arose all sorts of pairs of opposites. And then through attachment to these pairs of opposites, to these dualities, there comes spiritual death. There comes the dukkha and the, the mental suffering that arises from these attachments. So this is spiritual death. The Buddha intends that we are free of both kinds of death that both, neither kinds of death have any meaning for us. The Buddha can lead us away from spiritual death. The Buddha can cure this kind of death that arises from attachment to dualities. And then when spiritual death is cured, then it is possible to see physical death as just, as just an ordinary, natural, evolutionary process. That is just what it is, and there's nothing to be afraid of. So we need to understand both kinds of death, and the Buddha can help us to, to be free of both of these kinds of death, or free of death in all its meanings. Let me stress once again that birth, aging, or birth, old age, illness, and death are not dukkha in themselves. The problem of dukkha arises in the reactions and conditions associated with birth, old age, illness, and death. So the, the dukkha is not in these things themselves, but it's in the, the ignorant thoughts and reactions and feelings about birth, old age, illness, and death. That's where the dukkha is. When we summarize the meaning of dukkha in both the shortest and the most profound way, this is how we do it. The Buddha said that dukkha is in attachment to the five khanda. The five, the khanda are the aggregates or groups of clinging and attachment. So dukkha is in attachment to these five aggregates or five groups, the five khanda. 
Sometimes we attach to the body as I or as my body. And then when the body changes, there is depression and dukkha because of that physical change or because of attachment and then there is physical change. Or sometimes we attach to the feelings as, as I or as my feelings. And then when the feelings change, there is heavy heartedness, sadness, and depression. And this is dukkha. Or we can attach to the perceptions, the, the distinctions and identifications that the mind, that act, that the perceptions, distinctions, and identifications that the mind makes. And when we attach to these, as I or myself, and then they change, then that is dukkha. Or the thinking, the mental conditioning, we can attach to this, and it too changes, and then there is dukkha. Or consciousness, the bare knowing, the bare, in, when the mind knows that interaction between sense object and sense organ, that consciousness, we can attach to that as I, or as my consciousness. And then its change is dukkha for us. So attachment to any of these five things, any of these five things that we call the khanda, or the pancha khanda, these, this is dukkha, this attachment to any of the five khandas. We need to understand these five khanda because together they make up what we call life. These five khandas together are life. So in life there is always the body. And because there is the body there are sense organs. And through these sense organs there is contact with sense objects. And this contact gives rise to feeling. There's the pleasant feeling of liking the sense contact or the unpleasant feeling of disliking it or the uncertain feeling of not knowing whether to dislike it or like it. So there are feelings arising all the time. Then after the feelings there arise the perceptions and identifications or distinguishings of those sense contacts. And these are arising all the time. Then there is thinking about the sense contact. And this is happening all the time also. And then there is the consciousness, the eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness. And these are happening all the time as well. So these five khandas together are arising all the time and together they make up life. And when we go attaching to these things, there is dukkha. And so we need to understand them carefully. We need to study them and look into them. We can say that in order to know dukkha, to under, to, in order to really know dhamma, we must really know the five khandas. If we don't know the five khandas, then we don't really know ourselves. So in order to know Dhamma, we need to know ourselves. And so we need to know the five khandas. Sometimes when the body is, is functioning in one of its ways, we attach to the body as I. <coughs> Or, excuse me, there is a supreme kind of truth which we often overlook, and that is that we attach to the different khandas as I. So sometimes it's to the body khanda, the body aggregate as I. Or sometimes when the feelings, when one of the feelings is what's in the mind, when it, the feelings are functioning, then we attach to the feeling as I. This is me. 
or it can be the perceptions, the distinguishing between this and that, the noting of the distinguishing marks of something. We can attach to that as I, or our thinking, the mental linking of ideas can be the, the prominent thing in the mind. And we attach to that as I, this is what I am. I am my thoughts, my thinking. Or it can be that consciousness through the, the doors of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind. And this consciousness can be, we can attach to that when it is what is functioning, what is happening in the mind. So all of these five different khandas or aggregates are the things we attach to. And so what we attach to as I spins around, revolves between these, within these five aggregates. All that's been said shows that there is no self and there is no soul. This explanation shows that all there is is attachment to these different aggregates, to body, feeling, perception, thought, or consciousness as a self or a soul. But in reality, there is no self or soul. All there is is the mind, which has arisen naturally and is evolving and carrying on according to natural laws, this mind, in its natural way, goes and attaches to things as I or me or mine. It attaches to the body, the feelings, perceptions, thought, or consciousness as a self or as a soul. But you can see in the fact that this mind, in its way, is is attaching to all kinds of different things and never the same thing, that there is no real self or soul. And so, this knowledge of non-self or non-soul, that there is no real self or soul, just this, this attaching by the mind, this kind of thought of attachment, this, uh, this knowledge or wisdom of non-self protects us from dukkha. Dukkha arises because of these attachments to the five khandas. In knowing that there is no self, we can protect us, we can be protected from that attachment which leads to dukkha. So in summary, we need to see these five aggregates of clinging, we need to see the attachment to these five, to the things that are called the five khandas in order to protect ourselves from dukkha. To put it concisely, we can say that Buddhism is the religion of non-self or non-soul. If we state it even more strongly than this, we can say that Buddhism is the religion of no man. There are no men, there are no people, there are no human beings. All there are are the five khandas. All there are, or we can say all there is, is body and mind. Or we can break that up further and say all there is are the five khandas, and that there are no, there are really no people, no human beings. If you can understand this point, then you will understand Buddhism, and you will be able to protect yourself from dukkha. To avoid any misunderstandings, to protect you from falling into misunderstanding, let me point out for you to be very clear that Buddhism does not teach that there is nothing. Buddhism is not nihilistic or annihilationist. Buddhism does not teach that there isn't anything. What Buddhism says is there are things, but in those things 
there is no self and no soul. So see the difference between non-self, non-soul, which is Buddhism, and nihilism, which says that there is nothing whatsoever, and that is not Buddhism. So in order to avoid and prevent misunderstanding, please see the difference and realize that Buddhism teaches non-self, non-soul, but does not teach nihilism or nothingness. Be very clear that whenever there is attachment to the khandas together or any one of them, whenever there is this attachment to something, one of the khandas, as I, as me or mine, as myself, then there is immediately dukkha. That is, as soon as there is attachment to one of the khandas, dukkha immediately arises. So, please see this very carefully, very clearly, and understand that dukkha arises because of attachment to the khandas. Okay, what we were talking about was the first Arya Satya, the first noble truth of dukkha. Now we come to the second noble truth, the cause of dukkha. If you've understood what's been said so far, then you should be able to see what the cause of dukkha is. If you know what, if you were following and understanding the discussion of the first Arya Satya, then you should have a pretty good idea what the second Arya Satya is, the cause of dukkha. But to make it absolutely clear, we will emphasize that the cause of dukkha, the nearest most immediate cause of dukkha is attachment, is upadana, upadana, attachment to something, to anything, as I, as me, as mine, as myself. This attachment is the most direct and immediate cause of dukkha. But the bu- the usual way it's stated, the way the Buddha put it, is that dukkha comes from desire or craving, which is ignorant, stupid, foolish, wanting. When we want ignorantly, when our want is based in stupidity, that is called craving, or danha in Pali. Danha. This is what the Buddha says said was the, is the cause of dukkha. You can probably see for yourself that there's no contradiction between what the Buddha said and what we said just a moment ago. You can probably see that attachment arises from desire or from ignorant wanting. So when, when craving arises in the mind, then there arises the thought, the idea, or the feeling that there is an I who wants. So, the danha causes upadana, the, the ignorant craving causes the feeling of attachment to arise in the mind. And once that arises, there is dukkha. So there's no contradiction here. When we say attachment is the cause of dukkha, then we mean attachment is the nearest, most direct and immediate cause of dukkha. If we back up just a little bit, then we can say desire is the cause of dukkha. Desire causes attachment, which causes dukkha. So it is correct to say that desire causes dukkha as to say that attachment causes dukkha. It's mainly a matter of if we take the nearest, most immediate cause, or we take a cause which is a little farther back, a little farther away. This is the difference between saying craving is the cause of dukkha, or attachment is the cause of dukkha. If we back up all the way to the beginning 
of this whole process, then we can say that dukkha is caused by avicca or ignorance, by not knowing. Now there's no there's no problem in saying this. There's no dis, there's no argument. There's no contradiction. To say that dukkha is caused by avicca or not knowing is just to say that this process of dukkha begins with avicca. And as we learned, the, as you heard the other day, avicca or not knowing, ignorance, leads to stupid or ignorant contact, which, and then we get lost in the feelings, which is ignorance once again. So there are, there is, there is foolish or ignorant feeling. And from getting lost in these feelings, there arises ignorant want or danha, craving, which causes attachment, upadana. So to say that not knowing causes dukkha is the same as saying that desire or craving causes dukkha or that attachment causes dukkha because it's all the same process. It's just different links in the process which arise, which leads to dukkha. So it's a matter of if you take the most immediate cause or back up a little further or take it from the beginning. That's what determines whether we say that ignorance or craving or attachment is the cause of dukkha. If you understand this fully, if you understand what's being said completely and you realize it, not intellectually, but through, you see it within yourself, then your understanding is complete. And you'll know all you need to know. You ought to make yourselves understand this. You ought to see how this works, how this process which leads to dukkha arises. If you take a bird's eye view from way up here and look down and see dukkha, then you can see there's attachment leading to dukkha and then ignorant wanting or craving leads to attachment which leads to dukkha. And then if you back up all the way to the beginning, you see that there's not knowing, ignorance, which leads to ignorant contact. And from the ignorant contact arises stupid feeling and getting lost in this, this unwise feeling leads to craving, and the craving leads to desire. I'm sorry, the craving leads to attachment. Attachment is conditioned by craving. So when there is this craving, then there is the feeling of that there is an I that craves. And this conditions what we call bhava, or it's the becoming of the, the I. And then there is birth, the birth of the I. So from attachment, there is becoming, and then there is birth of the I. And as soon as there is this ignorant birth of the self, that leads to dukkha. So we can see it's just a line from avicca, ignorant contact, ignorant feeling, ignorant desire, attachment, becoming, birth, dukkha. So if we, if we, if we have a real bird's eye view and understand this whole process, we'll see just, we'll see just how it works and we'll be very clear about it. So this is a very important thing to study and come to understand. You should try to understand this process of dukkha. You should do whatever it takes to the end, to the fullest of your abilities to understand this process. The Buddha said that this is the beginning of the sublime way of life. This is the, the basics, the fundamentals, the ABCs of the highest level that we can live our lives. So to really be living on as sublime, as elevated, a plane as possible, we have to begin 
studying, learning, understanding these basic points of the way, the process by which dukkha arises. So you have to try as much as you can using all of your abilities, all of your energy to understand this and see how dukkha arises. This is very important. And this is the beginning point of developing the what we call the Pramajan or the sublime way of life. The most exalted, the most the highest way of living. There's another point we should add, which is, if you see this, this wheel of life, that this process of dukkha, then you see the Buddha. The Buddha said that if you see this, you see the real Buddha. To see the body or clothing of the Buddha is not to really see the Buddha. It's to see this Dhamma, this truth that we've just been talking about. That's what it means to see the Buddha. There were people in India at the time of the historical Buddha who saw him walking around, but they didn't really see the Buddha. And though they were living at the same time, they didn't see the Buddha. And though the historical Buddha died long ago, we can see the real Buddha by seeing the truth of this process of dukkha. If we really understand it, if we really understand the cause of dukkha, of this process, then we see the Buddha. This is what it means to see the Buddha. It has nothing to do with physical appearances. So we've spoken about the first two Ariya Satya, now the third one, which is the is called Nirota or Niroda. Niroda is extinction, the going out of dukkha, the end of dukkha. Now if you ex- understood what we were saying just now, then if you see that craving, that ignorant want is the cause of dukkha, then you'll see that by extinguishing craving, dukkha is extinguished. By putting out craving, then we put out dukkha. Or if you see that upadana, upadana, or attachment causes dukkha, then by extinguishing attachment, dukkha is extinguished. Or if you go way all the way to the beginning and see that not knowing, avicca, is the cause of dukkha, then you'll see that by putting out, by extinguishing that not knowing, that dukkha is extinguished in that way. So these various causes of dukkha that we talked about, put any one of them out and you put out dukkha. Extinguish one of, extinguish these causes and you extinguish dukkha. This is the third Ariya Satta. So we don't have to go into this third truth in great detail because if you see the cause of dukkha, then you'll see that the way to put out dukkha is to put out the cause. So. This just points out the great importance of understanding the cause of dukkha. So by understanding it, then you'll know the way to get rid of dukkha, the way to put it out. So we're not going to say any more about this third Ariya Satya, but just to emphasize that you need to understand the second truth, that is the cause of dukkha. And then the third truth, the extinction of dukkha will follow from that one and it will be easy to understand the third truth once the second one is understood. Now we come to the fourth Ariya Satya which is Maga. Maga means path or way and this is what we must practice. By practice we mean to walk along that way. By walking this way of the fourth noble truth, then we extinguish dukkha. We put out dukkha. So the way to this path that we must follow, we can, can be this, another way we can say it is, or to follow that path is to live rightly, to maintain one's life 
in correctness, to follow the path correctly. So there's this, when our life is correct and proper and right, and when life is fully established and maintained in correctness, then there is this path, which we call the Ariyamaka, the noble path, which has eight factors. It's one single path with eight factors. So to maintain oneself in rightness is to follow this path, this noble path, which has eight factors. We can also call it the Machimabhatipata, the middle way, the, the way that is balanced between various extremes. And so to be right and correct in life, is to be on this path which has eight factors. This is the fourth noble truth. The important point here is the word middle. To be in the middle, to be in the center. To not be too strict or too loose. Too tight or too loose. Or to not be wet or dry, to, but to be in the middle, to not go to the extreme left or the extreme right, but to be in the middle. This is the, this is the important part of being right, to be in the middle, not off in the extremes. This word middle has all kinds of different meanings and we don't really have time, or we don't really need to go into all of them. But we can summarize all these different meanings by saying, the middle, or being in the middle means not this and not that. Not neither this nor that, but in the middle. We, another way of saying this is that there is only itapajayata, the law that all things arise and happen through causes and conditions. They are not this and they are not that. They are just these, the arising through causes and conditions. Neither this nor that. Only things happening through causes and conditions. Only this processing causes and conditions. But neither this nor that. But in the middle. To, to live life or walk life or, or follow life in a state of correctness and rightness means to be in the middle. It means to be on this noble path which has eight, eight factors or eight aspects. So it is by fulfilling these eight aspects or factors that one is in the middle or that one is on the noble path. This is what it is to follow and live the Noble Eightfold Way, to maintain in a state or condition of rightness. Don't, please don't listen incorrectly or misunderstand and think that there are eight paths. There are not eight paths, there is only one path. There is one path which has eight components or eight factors, but there is only one path. It's like a rope that has eight strands, and the eight strands are woven together into one single rope. And so it is that there is one path, one noble path, which is, has eight components or factors, which must come together or which are together, inseparably, in the one noble path. Or we can compare it like this. The noble path is like a road leading from this city to some distant city. It's only one road, that, there's just one road that goes from here to there. But to, to travel that road, we need a map, and then we need some bridges, like to go over rivers. And we need some means of protection, 
say, police to deal with thieves and bandits and robbers, and we need to keep the tigers and elephants and wild beasts away. And then we need food because it's a long trip. And so it's like this. There's one path, one road, but to travel it, there must be eight useful things that are eight useful components to this one road to get from this city to that distant city. The noble path is like this, just one noble path with eight very useful components. There's another very special meaning which you maybe have heard before. There's a single path for a single person. This single path can only be walked by this single person. Nobody can walk that path for that person. There's just the one path for this one person. Not only this, not only is there the single path for the single person who must walk that path, that single path, but there is a single destination for that person on that path. And that single destination is Nibbana. It's the coolness of the extinction of defilements in Dukkha. So there are these three single things. Single path, single person, or single traveler, and the single destination, Nibbana. So now let's look at these eight components of the single path. These are eight rightnesses eight correctnesses which come together in the path. The first of these, the first rightness, we can call right opinion, right view, right knowledge, right understanding, right viewpoint, whatever, any of these words, but it's the right knowledge, the right understanding, the right view. This is called sama titi, sama titi. It's the first component of the path. This samatiti, right knowledge, right belief, right understanding, has to come first. There are all kinds of knowledge <clears throat> in the world, but right knowledge is just the knowledge that it takes for the noble to follow the noble way. And so this right knowledge where we be, that we begin with is the knowledge that we can extinguish dukkha. This is right knowledge, right understanding, right belief. So samatiti, or right understanding, is the understanding of dukkha, understanding the cause of dukkha, understanding the extinction of dukkha, is the ex happens by extinguishing the cause of dukkha, and understanding the path, the way that leads to the cause of dukkha. This is the beginning of the path, is this right understanding. If you don't have this understanding, there's no way you'll even find or think of following the path. So it begins with this right knowledge or right understanding. The next component is right want, right intention, sama sankapa. When there is right understanding, then we know what we should want. We want to stop dukkha, we want to extinguish dukkha. This is right want, or sama sankapa. It follows from right understanding. Without right understanding, there cannot be right want or right intention. So when we understand about dukkha and the end of dukkha and the path leading to the end of dukkha, then we have the, the right want to end dukkha and to do what we have to do to end dukkha. This is right wanting. Now don't go and confuse this with greed, lust, and craving, which are all we can also call want, but those are stupid or ignorant want which leads to dukkha and have are based in ignorance and foolishness <clears throat> and delusion rather than 
in knowledge and correct understanding. So there is right intention or right want that is supported by right view and right, un right understanding. We can see another way of putting it is sankapa, which by the way is a good word to remember and understand that sankapa is different than lopa, which is greed, and danha, craving. Sama sankapa is the kind of want that you should want, whereas lopa, greed, and craving is the kind of want that you don't want, that you shouldn't want. So there's wanting that we want, which is, leads to the end of dukkha, and there is the unwantable want, which leads to dukkha. So see the difference between right want, sankapa, and ignorant want, or craving. When there is right want, then we go about doing what we need to do to get the thing we want, to achieve what is wanted. And so the third component is right speech. It is part of what we must do in line with the right want. Right speech is speech that does no harm to anyone. It is truthful and honest. It is useful. It's not useless or frivolous. And it is pleasant to hear. The right speech is truthful, useful, and pleasant. This is the third component, right speech. The first two components, right view or right understanding and then right want, we can group together as the wisdom aspect or wisdom department of the path. Now we're talking about the morality or right or behavior aspect of the path. So there's right speech, and then the fourth component or factor is right conduct. Right conduct means non-killing, non-stealing, um, not indulging in improper sexual conduct. These are just some examples of what right conduct is. So right conduct is, is conduct that doesn't cause problems for oneself or others. So this is the fourth component of the path. The fifth rightness or component is right livelihood or sama achiwa. Achiwa is to maintain one's life. And this sama achiwa is to do so in a right way. This means obtaining food, clothing, shelter, and medicine, the things necessary for life, in a right way, a way that does not cause problems or do harm to oneself or others. This is the fifth component, right livelihood. Now the three factors we just spoke about make up the group that is right conduct or sila, morality. Now we come to the, la the group that we can call meditation, which is the mental, the mind aspect of the group or aspect of the path. So the sixth component, the first one of the mental group, the meditation group, is right effort, sama vayama, right effort, it's trying in the right way, it's putting forth effort in order to extinguish dukkha. This is right effort. So this means not causing wrong things to arise or abandoning wrong things that already exist or have that have already ex arisen and then causing right things, good useful things to arise or the good and skillful things that have already arisen it's strengthening those, developing those, maintaining those. So these four, these are the four right efforts, these four ways of, of trying to extinguish dukkha, which make up the sixth component. 
And now we come to the seventh rightness, the which is correct mindfulness, samasati. Samasati is self-awareness, recollection, um, ref- the ability of the mind to reflect upon itself. This is sati, samasati. Samasati is generally talked about as the four foundations of mindfulness, which are the body, the feelings, the mind, and truth. These are four things which the mind should be aware of, it should recollect, it should reflect upon. So when there is samasati, mindfulness keeps rightness, it governs rightness, it keeps the rightness here, and it keeps the mind mindful of, or gathered on, or centered on rightness. So this is Sama Sati. When we talk about these four foundations of mindfulness, the body, the feelings, the mind, and truth, the most profound and complete way of practicing this Sama Sati is Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, which you are learning here. Because through mindfulness of breathing, right mindfulness is developed in a complete and full way. And not only that, it is mindfulness that has the sole aim of extinguishing dukkha. So therefore it is correct, it is proper, and it is complete. Because the process of anapanasati fulfills these four foundations of mindfulness on the, mi- on the body or in the body, mindfulness in the feelings, mindfulness in the mind and mindfulness in truth or recollection of these reflection upon them awareness of them these are the four right mindfulnesses and anapanasati is the most complete the most efficient and correct way to fulfill this seventh rightness or seventh component of the path so there must be right mindfulness, both in general and in the most, the deepest and most profound levels of life. So this is Sama Sati, right mindfulness. Now we come to the eighth component, which is Sama Samati, or right Samati, right Samati. Samati means to set or found the mind establish the mind securely and correctly. This is Sama Samati. To securely, correctly establish, to set up the mind, to found it, to ground it securely and firmly. Sama Samati has three components or characteristics. The first one is purity. The mind that is sama samati is pure. The mind is pure. The second is steadiness, stability. So the mind is steady and stable. And the third is agility, alertness, activeness. So then the mind is agile, alert, very skillful, active. So sama samati is to securely establish and correctly establish the mind. And then it is pure, steady, stable, and active. And Sama Samati has as its object or aim, Nibbana, that is the the extinction of the fires of Dukkha. And so Sama Samati is just step-by-step development of samati towards the mind that is well-established, that is securely grounded, and then which aims, which focuses itself, directs itself towards nibbana. This is sama samati. They all come together 
in sama samati, in right samati. Sama samati is the one that cuts the defilements, that destroys the defilements, that puts out dukkha. This is the one that does all that work. And so to aid it, to aid sama samati, there are the other seven rightnesses which are supporters to sama samati, which does the actual job of cutting through all the problems through, through destroying spiritual illness. <clears throat> and so you can see the eight factors, and then when they come together, then there is sama samati, which is aimed at nibbana, which all it sees, it's just pointed right at nibbana, and it just cuts through all the defilements with the aid of the other seven until all dukkha is destroyed, and then there is nibbana. There's one more fact we have to talk about. When sama samati is fulfilled, when it's completely developed and established, then it causes samayana or right knowledge, or right, right insight knowledge. The samayana is knowledge or insight into the impermanence of all conditioned things, <clears throat> into the dukkha of all conditioned things, and into the non-selfness, the selflessness of all things whatsoever. When there is this insight knowledge into impermanence, dukkha, and anatta, or non-self, then there arises the loosening of attachment to things. And as attachment loosens, as there's the releasing of, of things attached to, then there is the end of attachment. And with the, er the end of attachment, there is the giving back to nature of all the things we have attached to. This knowledge of impermanence, dukkha, and non-self, and then the knowledge of this easing of attachment, the loosening of attachment, and then the end of attachment, this is called right insight knowledge. When there is right insight knowledge, then there is right deliverance. The mind has gone beyond attachment. The mind is liberated. There is right liberation. So the eight factors of the path are the necessary causes. They are the things that we must practice and do or the, the path, the one path with these eight factors that we must practice, that we should do. And when it is done, there arise these two fruits of the practice, right insight knowledge and right deliverance or right liberation, right salvation. So we don't always have to talk about these last two because if we fulfill the first eight, we, we follow the middle way, then these last two fruits arise automatically. So this is why we usually just talk about the first eight, because that's all that's necessary for our practice. But to understand completely and to explain it completely, we have to talk about the ten, the eight causes and the two fruits or results. Eight plus two is ten, and this is the ten rightnesses the ten correctnesses. If we understand these ten correctnesses, then we understand the entire process, the entire path and fruit that leads to the liberation of the mind, that is the liberation of the mind. So these ten things are everything we need to know about Buddhism. But in the Fourth Noble Truth, we speak specifically about the eight, because these are the things we must do. This is what me must be done. And it's not necessary to talk about these two, because if the eight are accomplished and fulfilled, these two don't, they don't go anywhere, they're not lost. They automatically arise with the fulfillment of the eight factors of the, the middle way. So this is what we need 
This is all there is to know in Buddhism. And particularly, we need to be interested in, we need to understand, develop, practice, put all our effort, all our attention, all our life into these eight causes which lead to the two fruits. So you should be very interested in this last noble truth. To summarize the Noble Eightfold Path is to say that we, we travel life, we, we, walk the, we walk our lives with mindfulness and wisdom in action. Through mindfulness we are applying the necessary wisdom mm. to every event, every situation, every moment of life. So there is no carelessness. It is a life free of carelessness. When life is lived through craving and desire, then there is, we're not on the path. But when there is right want or sama sankapa, then we're on that path of sati sampajanya, mindfulness and wisdom in action that is not at all careless in any way. This is to live life correctly. This is to be on the middle way. If you're centered and on the middle way, then you will not see things as positive or as negative. By the way, they don't have these words in Thai. <laughs> you're, but you're in the middle. You're centered and balanced. There's no positive, there's no negative. Or there's no optimism, no pessimism. We don't see things optimistically or pessimistically, pessimistically, but you're in the middle. You're balanced on the way. So this is what the middle way means. To be in the middle. Not be off in positive or negative optimism or pessimism. These kind of things. But in the middle, centered. This is the middle way. When you're centered in the middle way, then you'll be able to laugh at, to laugh away all the pairs of opposites, all the dualities, such as good and bad, or good and evil, such as winning and losing, gaining and missing, having the advantage or being on the disadvantage, debit or credit and debit. All of these opposites, all of these dualities which so much of the world is caught up in, they can just be laughed away when one is on the path, when one is there in the middle because these things no longer have any meaning when one is in the middle, when one is balanced and centered in correctness. And then there's one more very special thing, or not really special at all. <laughs> there's one more thing you'll meet up with when you're on the middle way. This is datata, suchness, thusness. It's the just isness of things, the way they are, the exact thusness of things. And when there's one is centered in the middle way and realizes da ta ta, things are seen just as they are. There's nothing marvelous about anything. Nothing is special. Nothing is nothing can grab the mind and influence. Nothing can pull the mind out of its peace and cool and calmness. Nothing disturbs the mind. Rockets to the moon all the fancy things that science and technology are developing, none of these are marvelous. Everything is just seen as they are. They're just what they are. They are, but there's nothing special about them. They're just what they are, that's all. It's very simple. And so when one has this fruit of being on the middle way, nothing can pull the mind out of itself. 
Nothing can disturb it. And this is the fruit. Tathata is a fruit of the middle way. So when there is Tathata, nothing is marvelous, nothing is special. We only see the end of Dukkha. So the last thing that happens in the end is that we know, or you will know, the real Buddha. You'll know the real Dhamma and the true Sangha. By the real Buddha, you know the one who extinguished Dukkha, who traveled the middle way and extinguished Dukkha. You know the real Dhamma, the true Dhamma that helps us to extinguish Dukkha. And you know the genuine, real Sangha, all those who have followed this way after the Buddha and extinguished Dukkha. So by being on the middle way, by following the middle way, one really sees Dukkha and one really sees the end of Dukkha. One sees the true Buddha, the true Dhamma, and the true Sangha. That's the end of the story. Think this is Finis. So finally, I would like to express the hope that all of you understand what I've been saying and that you will step by step, bit by bit, put this into practice in order to make a use, make use of your life in a way that cannot be compared with any other way of living, with any other thing that you could do. So I hope you understand what's been said and can put it into practice in order to live a life which is beyond compare with any other lifestyle. And at this point, I, I request that the talk end. Thank you very much for coming.